Welcome to Air Crew Interview, I'm Mike and your host. In this episode, we chat to Matt Hall about his US Air Force Exchange flying the F-15E Strike Eagle. In the second half, Matt chats about the training and how it differed from Australia, what the aircraft was like to fly, DACT, and flying it over Iraq. We wrap up by talking about his current role as an air racing pilot and what it's all about and his favourite places to fly. Thank you and enjoy. And then something special happened. You managed to get a US Air Force exchange flying the Strike Eagle. Can you tell us how this came about? Yeah, so that was a pretty special thing. So um, there's between the United States Air Force and Australia and Australia and the UK and uh, Australia and the United States Marine Corps, um, there's, there's exchange programs. And it's really just to cross-pollinate ideas to make sure that we're all doing about the same thing um, in tactics so that if there is a conflict, like you know, the Gulf War, um, that uh, you can have different countries turn up into the conflict and be doing generally the same tactics and the same language and the same, the same roles and responsibilities. Um, the other reason we have exchange programs is so that when uh, you get high-ranking officers in the Air Force and that have been on exchange programs, you can have chiefs of air force who know each other personally, mm. working with each other um, between the two forces. Because um, yeah, they, they were twenty years ago working with each other as uh, as young as young pilots. So I was uh, I was selected for uh, one of these exchange programs um, back in uh, the end of two thousand and one to uh, go to America and fly the the Strike Eagle, which you know, yeah is um, is is, uh, is great because um, that that was and probably still is my favorite um multi-role fighter uh, that's out there it's um you know ever since i was uh, in in uh, high school um you know i saw an f-15 once and thought that is that is such a magic aircraft um you know it's uh it really is the uh you know the king of the sky the f-15 and then when you strap bombs to it it's like you know nothing stops it so uh, <laughs> to get to go and fly yeah you know, i was already fortunate to be able to fly F-18s for a career, um, you know, something that, you know, to be a fighter pilot and fly fly your country's leading fighter, but then to go and live in another country on the other side of the world and fly what I, as I say, considered to be the, the world's best uh, multi-role fighter uh, was was uh, quite, uh, quite a privilege. Absolutely. And did you get a choice of aircraft or was that just the aircraft you were selected for? It was the aircraft I was selected for, but also the aircraft I was applying for. So you can go and do an exchange onto the F-18 with the Marine Corps. You can do an exchange onto the F-18 with the Navy. Um, but I asked for the... Um, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> First time I've ever done that, actually. Sneeze in an interview. Um, so uh, I asked specifically for that, that exchange being the, um, the Strike Eagle because I wanted to fly the Strike Eagle. Yeah, so when you got there, uh, you know, uh, I guess a paper or the call saying it's definitely happening, how did you feel? You must have been like, get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, um, well, it was a funny situation, actually, because, um, you know, I was told about it in about the middle of 2001 that I'd be going to America to start my course at the start of 2002. Uh, and then September 11 occurred. Mm. And it's like, uh-oh, what's going to mm. happen here? Uh, um and I didn't know whether my exchange would be cancelled or whether I'd be going in a different role. I didn't know if Australia was going to be going into combat operations and I was going to be uh, yeah, left behind. I had no idea what was going to happen. And uh, so it wasn't until I was actually in America on the course that I believed it was going to occur. But, yeah, oh, wow. it was um, an amazing thing to, to climb into an F-15 and blast off. And um, because, you know, I was obviously already um, you know, experienced in fighter ops, I got to do some pretty cool things on my. I still had to do a conversion course with a normal a normal class of of young kids learning to fly their first fighter, but I was given some extra privileges and uh, yeah, it was interesting. My very first my very first flight in um, in an F fifteen, um, we took off and we went to a tanker and hit the tanker and got uh, got some extra fuel and went and had a three hour mission as my first ride. Wow. I was like, wow, you don't do that in Hornet. <laughs> Definitely not, but uh, yeah. What squadron and uh, were you assigned to, and where were you based? Um, I ended up flying in um, uh, being assigned to three different squadrons. So I was based in um, 
in uh, Seymour Johnson in uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina. And I was flying um, initially with the 334th, um, the, the Eagles, um, for my initial training. I was then sent to um, the 336 EFS to fight in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom over in, um, in the Middle East. And then I returned to America to the 333rd Lancers, um, who were um, with the squadron that I did my um, durate, the, the majority of my, um, my instructing in. Uh, I was then lent to other squadrons as an instructor for periods of time, you know, a week here, a week there, uh, to, other, to other units as well. So, yeah, how did the initial uh, ground training and flying training compare to the Australian Air Force? Uh, was there a big difference there? there? There was a bit of a difference. Um, the The way they ran their course was a bit different um, um, at the time, whereas Australia has now actually adopted the way America was doing it. So they have uh, civilians doing the ground school. They're, they're okay. ex-fighter pilots, but they're now civilians. Um, and they would do all the ground school and the sim training. And then the flying training was done by um, the Air Force guys. Whereas in the Air Force I'd been brought up in, in Australia, um, there were no civilian contractors. Everyone was, uh, yeah, so I gave, I gave the lecture on how the landing gear works and then take them out there and show them how to dogfight with the plane as well. Um, whereas that's now in our system, uh, it's, it's adapted to the same that you know, civilian contractors, ex-fighter pilots do all of the groundwork and then the Air Force guys are kept just for the flying side. Um, the, there was a lot less flying as well um, in the USAF. So the missions were longer, be, being an F-15, you can fly for longer, yeah, three-hour yeah. mission, no problems. Um, so you'd do a lot more in a mission. So. Uh, when I was first learning, for example, first learning the Hornet, um, you know, your first your first rides, uh, you'd go out to be doing, um, you know, at GF1, which is you know, general flying. It'd be basically take off, head on out to the airspace, go supersonic for 30 seconds, do some tight turns, come back, do like five or six circuits, and you're out of gas. Mm. Whereas, as I said, my first flight in uh, in the F-15 was a three-hour mission. You know, we took off. We hit the tanker, we topped up, we then went out into the airspace and we did everything you can do as a single ship in the aircraft, including, yeah, showing me air to air, it's a bit of air to ground stuff. We then went and did some instrument approaches to burn off some weight. We then went and did a heap of touch and goes. Uh, we then went and did some straight in approach, single engine straight in approaches um, until we finally you know, landed and shut down three hours later. And you'd get out of the cockpit and you're just drenched in sweat. <laughs> go, Phew, my brain has just melted because yeah. I've, been, I've just done a whole conversion course in one flight. Wow. Um, you typically only fly twice a week because of that, because you'd fit so much into one flight. But uh, yeah, you'd want to be prepared for that one flight. Absolutely. And you mentioned it before, your first flight there. Um, could you feel the power difference on that takeoff uh, compared to the Hornet? No, no, you couldn't actually, because oh, okay. generally when you fly on the F-15, it was uh, it's a much heavier aircraft. Yeah. So yeah, it's you know, the Hornet. The Hornet was. Uh, the engines we had, the, we were running 16,000 pounds per thrust per side in full bonus, so 32,000 pounds of thrust. And in the clean configuration, you'd take off at about 38,000 pounds of, uh, of weight. So you'd be, you know, you're sitting, you're sitting a bit over a, a, a bit under a one to one power to weight ratio. Uh, the Strike Eagle will fly on the, uh, the, the, the Pratt 220 engines, so they are about 22,000 a side, so 44,000 pounds a, a thrust, but we're taking off in a 65,000 pound aircraft. So you actually had less power to weight ratio on the F-15. Mm. Um, but what the F-15 would do is um, it'd swallow a whole heap more air it can, and it had a much cleaner airframe for going fast. So it was better at going fast um and if you kept it fast it swallowed all the air and mm. produced a huge amount of power and would be able to would be able to go all day yeah and obviously one of the big differences you had to work with a whistle how did you find that um uh, <laughs> when i had a good whistle it was great when i had a bad whistle i'd rather have the extra gas <laughs> um yeah a good whistle can can more than double the capability of the aircraft uh whereas um you know, it's, if you're not communicating well with uh, with your wizzo, 
yeah, he can actually suck your own SA out of your head and make you worse than you would be if you're a single seat pilot. Mm. Yes, <laughs> yeah, because I, um, I always said uh, when I talk to tornado guys, I always like I love a back seat. And when you talk to a single seat guy, they're like, Nah, I don't want anyone in the back. <laughs> yeah, it, it really did come down to who uh, who was the uh, the guy yeah. in the back seat, the guy or the girl in the back seat. So obviously the Strike Eagle was it? Was this main role air to ground, or did you actually conduct any air to air? Its main role was air to ground, but we did air to air. So um, you know, you know, we we were we were self escorting for air to air, which yeah, that is an air to air role to self escort into a target. Um, but uh, in the combat ops I was involved in, I, I was I, I had dedicated air to air roles. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a swing mission, so yeah, I'd go in there and I'd self escorting interdiction. Um, clean off my bombs and then go to the tanker, top back up again while still airborne, then push back into the airspace because I had, still had a full air-to-air -air loadout because I hadn't shot anything, um, and go back into the airspace as a full air-to-air -air loadout is a is a dedicated air-to-air -air platform. You know, I, I, I escorted a, a B-2 um, Spirit into, uh, into in for a bombing run, um, dedicated air-to-air -to, -air to uh, keep him safe. So, you know, so there was dedicated air-to-air -air missions we did. It's just that in the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, there wasn't a single um, adversary fighter launched. Yeah, there was there was a couple of tweaks. I got committed onto a um, an alert. Um, basically, yeah, we've got uh, signs of a MiG 29s um, just powered up at this airfield in the north of Iraq. Yeah, go and uh, wow. I was basically committed onto that. Yeah, I was off the tanker and they're like, "You're cleared. You're cleared to engage." So it was like light the burners up into the uh, stratosphere, basically, and get there as fast as possible to uh, take that guy out before he uh, did any damage, but uh, he shut down again, <laughs> which probably is good for him because he wouldn't have lived. Yeah. Um, and it's good for me because I didn't have to deal with it afterwards. <laughs> exactly. But uh, did you actually ever conduct any DACT and how did the F-15E Strike Eagle fare against the other types? Yeah, I did, did once again a lot of DACT with the, uh, the F-15. Uh, it wasn't a great aircraft for um, visual manoeuvring because it was a heavy plane, you know, it was, it was a very heavy aircraft. It had, um, you know, with the conformal fuel tanks, you know, the conformal fuel tanks, yeah, they were a bit of drag, they were a bit of weight. If they were full, they were very heavy um, and you, you couldn't jettison them. But a lot, of, a lot of the problem with it came from the drag of the CFTs from the, um, the weapons mounting stations. So you had six mounting stations for bombs down each CFT, so 12, 12 mounting stations which they're not, they're not streamlined. These are things just stuck out in the airflow with lugs all over yeah. them, um, trying to drag that through the airstream at, uh, you know, 800 knots has a, has a massive effect. So um, they, they were a very draggy aircraft. Um, the F-15, I think, you know, it's a very basic aircraft. Um, you know, there's no leading edge flaps. There's no, there's no auto flaps on the trailing edge. There's no drooping ailerons or anything like that. It's, a, it's effectively a delta wing with a tailplane. Um, but it's a very clever delta wing. You know, it's, a, it's an amazingly well-designed wing for what it is. Um, so it could go very fast and had a really good climb profile on it, amazing um, Rutowski profile that you could do. That's, that's why the Streak Eagle, I think it still maintains the records for time to climb yeah. uh, records out there because uh, it's an amazingly well-designed wing. Um, but when you slowed it down, uh, it was it it was hard to get it fast again. So the the key with an F-15 was to keep it fast as long as possible, and only cash in your energy for a for a massive move if it was no kidding last ditch effort, or you're guaranteed to get the kill, and then you can take your time to regain your energy. Mm -hmm. And it must have been nice having that uh, big head um, that big hood in the cockpit because that it looks massive compared to the Hornets. Yeah, it is. The, uh, the, the F-15's HUD is limited by the canopy bow. It, it touches the <laughs> canopy bow uh, like that. And so just, it's basically a panoramic um, HUD. And the reason they did that actually was uh, because of the lantern. So uh, because it had the lantern system on it for doing um, terrain following radar and night, night ops. <clears throat> so um, it had the, um, the infrared pod on one side. Um, so you see an F-15E strike eagle, very easy to recognize. It's got two chin pods. Uh, one's the uh, targeting pod um, with the laser laser for pointing, uh, you know, doing laser guided weapons, and the other pod is the um, the for the the lantern ops of doing night terrain following radar, and the IR pod in that was a steering array, uh, whereas the targeting pod was a was a steerable array, and it'd take the steering array uh, IR pod 
and then project that up into the HUD. So at night time, you had forward visibility of what's in front of you um, projected straight onto the HUD. So you could see in front of you at night time. That became um, uh, not needed when we started flying with night fishing goggles, which occurred when I was on the exchange. We were, so I started learning with that system, um, mm-hmm. getting it projected into the HUD, and then we transitioned onto the night vision goggles, and you never turn that thing on again. But it was amazing having such a big HUD, for having so much information being able to be presented to the pilot in one go, to the point that when I came back off that exchange and I jumped in a Hornet, um, <laughs> you know, I did my first takeoff in a Hornet, I was turning crosswind, and I just started laughing. I had my mate, one of my best mates in the back seat, and, is, and I'm turning crosswind, I'm laughing my head off. He's like, what are you laughing at? And I'm like, how small everything is in this aircraft. <laughs> and he was actually quite offended because, you know, he, he, he'd only ever flown the F-18. He's like, well, you know, this is my baby. You're laughing at him. I'm like, yeah, but it's like the Hud's, the Hud's this big man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, what was it like flying over in the U.S. compared to Australia? Was there more rules in the U.S. compared to um, back home? No, I'd say there were less rules, actually. Um, it's funny. You know, America, you sort of think is, you know, you know, very yes, sir, no, sir, three bags, full, sir. Sort of yeah. Thing. Um, but the airspace was pretty liberal. Um, you know, you could just um, you could just blast blast off. It, like the base had just a, a two thousand foot cylinder, five mile cylinder around it. You needed clearance to go in and out of. Apart from that, it was outside controlled airspace. So, if you were doing a max performance departure in an F fifteen, you'd have to call the tower because your radar doesn't work on the ground. You'd have to call tower saying we're on for a max profile takeoff, and they'd say stand by. There's a Cessna flying overhead the field okay, the Cessna's gone, you can go. And then you're just like, no kidding, stand on its tail and blast off vertically to 30,000 feet through no man's land to get into controlled airspace to then transit out into uh, overwater ops to do, uh, to do your ops. Same, same, in the overwater ops in the military airspace, um, in Australia, uh, we have military airspace, but it's divided up so it's exclusive airspace per formation. Right. So if I'm going out there to do a 1v1 in Australia, I'll be allocated a chunk of airspace that I don't have to worry about anyone else in there. It's just me and my wingman doing our thing. Whereas in America, it's like, well, that's military airspace. It's like, just go in there and do what you want. So you'd be doing a, you'd be doing a 1v1 fight with an F-15 and a, and a, and a two-ship of F-16s would just come through the middle of it. Or you'd see a Hornet doing something, you just roll in on them and gun them, and they're like, hey, leave us alone. So it was a bit of a free-for-all of everything you could do out there. So, um, yeah, there, there were some things that were amazing like that and there are other things that were just very restrictive but uh, you know it's it's all you know it all achieved the same thing there yeah and you kind of you mentioned it before you flew um on live operations in iraq uh, can you tell us about this and did you actually expect to be you know fly in real world you know kind of operations yeah it, it's um you know, when you first join the military I'd say most people join hoping that there's not a conflict because, you know, you, you don't want to go and get shot at. Um, but after you've been in the military a short time, your brain changes to not wanting a war so that you can go to it, but you know, you realise very quickly that if there is a war, you're going to put your hand up because that's your job. Um, and uh, so when when the war kicked off over there or looked like it was going to be kicked off, I had my hand up to, to go and... It took a it took a bit of paperwork and a bit of processing for me to be able to go there because you know I was, I was still an Australian officer, yeah. um, you know, I was wearing Australian rank, but uh, in an American squadron that went to war, so there was some there were some technical issues that needed to be sorted out. But uh, it's uh, you know as I say you, you don't join thinking you you're going to go to war and you'd be thinking if there is a war how would I get out of it because I don't want to get shot at. But uh, you don't think that way once you're there and. Um, and uh, yeah, you stand you stand proud shoulder shoulder with um, with your comrades, so uh, you know ready to face the action and do what you've got to do on your country's um, direction. So uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting time in my life. You know, I learned I learned quite a bit about myself. I learned um, quite a bit about the world, um, and yeah, saw uh, saw some interesting things. Did some things I'm extremely proud of, um, but I saw some stuff that I uh, yeah I'm. Uh, I wish I hadn't. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 definitely something that I'm glad I had the opportunity to to be there uh, and do my thing. Um, but in retrospect, it'd be better if it never happened in the first place. Mm, yeah. And did you work closely with the Allied nations? Yeah, yeah. So um, so the base the base I was on uh, in the Middle East, we had um, 
we had the Aussies there with uh, with some Hornets. So some of you know, my my best mates and some of my ex students oh, wow. were. Uh, we had six F 18s on the base. We had something like forty eight Strike Eagles, or you know, I think it was forty eight Strike Eagles on the base. We had uh, uh, the United States Navy with some Tomcats. Some F 14s were there still. Oh, nice. Um, we had uh, some. Uh, sea Harriers uh, based there as well from um, from the RAF. We had a couple of tornadoes uh, there. Most of them were up in Kuwait. Um, we had uh, Marines uh, in Kuwait with Hornets. We had uh, we had F one one sevens on on the same base as us. Um, what else did we have? That's about it. And then we had we had long range ops from um, B ones, B twos, and B fifty twos where we're doing long range ops. So. It was mainly American, but it was a lot of aircraft. It was the, you know, I, I heard somewhere that it was the uh, the most powerful um, contingent of strike fighter aircraft ever assembled at the time on the base I was on. With uh, if you looked at the firepower that was on that base, uh, there'd never been anything like it uh, in history. Um, yes, yeah, so it was it was an interesting thing to be involved in. That's for sure. Yeah, it's like an aviation geek's dream that <laughs> all them different types. <laughs> Yeah, but, no, uh, it was a it was a uh, an air show you wouldn't read about. <laughs> so, how often would you fly, and how many missions did you actually um, do? Oh, um, I should know this, but uh, I don't really. It's um, I, I flew. Yeah, sometimes I'd fly twice a night. Um, sometimes I'd go for yeah. I, I, the first two weeks I flew every day uh, or every basically night. I flew almost exclusive night ops. So I flew every night for the first uh, two weeks. I then had a week off because I was burnt out um, mm. psychologically and physically. Um, so I had a week off, but your week off is actually working in the planning the planning table. Yeah, maybe have a day off, but you don't want a day off when you're in, in the desert. What are you going to do? <laughs> Hang out in your tent. <laughs> um, and then I went back and did another two to three weeks of constant ops. Um, and then I was only in the theatre for six weeks, and then I went home. Um, so um, after six weeks, the shock and awe, because yeah, I, was I was in the shock and awe mission, the shock and awe um, uh, marched forward to gain air superiority, happened on the first night, effectively, and then to support the march of the ground forces into um, downtown Baghdad uh, occurred in that six-week period, basically, and then it was uh, into to close quarter ops. And they just didn't need the uh, the large firepower there, so the majority of um, of the fighters uh, went home at that point. And um, when you said you went back home, do you mean back home like to Australia or just back to America? Back to America, my home in America. Yeah, so it's a funny thing. Yep. So back back home to my home in America at the time, and then uh, it was another year and a half before I actually went back home to a bit over a year and a half before I went back home to Australia. Yeah, and so what was it like being a, an Aussie going to America? Did they did you find incorporate into the squadron and their life in general quite easy? Yeah, it was it was very easy. Um, you know, they uh, they really embraced me, um, not only as one of their own, but as uh, almost like their mascot. You know, because um, <laughs> you know the, the Aussie, I was obviously different to the rest, and uh, you know I don't mind uh, I don't mind having fun and uh, having a laugh at stuff. So. Um, I was uh, I was always the yeah you know, always the guy that they grabbed if they wanted to have a great time and uh, go somewhere it was like uh, pull up past my house pull me out of my house and throw me in the car and steal <laughs> me and take me somewhere so um, I had a, I had a great time I, I I saw a huge amount of America while I was there yeah, I went travelling most weekends um, you know they let me take F fifteen away for the week you know, I'd go and sign an F fifteen out and uh, take it away for the weekend and stuff like that so. I nice. uh, got got to got to see a huge amount of America and made some lifelong friends. And uh, yeah, just this morning I got um, you know I got a message from one of my lifelong friends over there. You know, he's now he's now the deputy chief of the United States Air Force. You know that's wow. that whole um, perspective thing. But yeah, he was uh, one of my best mates and he still is. He just texted me a, a message today saying how I was going. So oh, right. uh, you know, it's, it was very a very nice situation. So it sounds like you had a great time over there. So how many hours did you get on the Strike Eagle? Uh, a little bit over 500 hours. So, um, as I say, we don't fly that often. So, I was there for three years um, to get just over 500 hours. So, it's you're really only doing about 170, 180 hours <clears throat> a year um, because you're only flying that, you know, two times a year sort of thing. Sorry, two times a week sort of thing. Um, a lot of people know you from your air racing. Tell us how you got into this. Oh, 
<laughs> long story, but you know, uh, the quick summary is I was already flying aerobatics on weekends and flying fighters during the week, and I went to an air race in Perth, and they said, interesting combo. Uh, would like to, do you want to have a crack at this? Yeah, because um, I already flew those types of planes, but I was obviously already a, a professional pilot who was good at working under pressure. Um, so I did about two years of training with them, and they accepted me as a uh, pilot, and I started racing. So. So yeah, are most of the pilots uh, ex-military or a lot of them civilians? When I when I went in, um, I think I was the third ex-military person, but I was the first to come out of the military to race. There were two others who had been in the military but then had careers since then, in the airlines, for example. Um, so after I was in, then there started to be a bit of a roll of uh, fighter pilots throughout the world going, that's that's pretty interesting uh, career, um, and I'd say now uh, at least half of the pilots entering into the air race, uh, trying to get into the air race, are ex-military. Can you tell us what air racing is about for our viewers who may not know what uh, the sport is? Uh, the race I was involved was uh, the Red Bull Air Race, uh, which is no longer a thing, um, but uh, that was really. Uh, air inflated pylons that they call air gates. Uh, it's a, against the clock, so it's one aircraft at a time and uh, just basically running through a fairly tight track at uh, you know, 50 feet off the ground or the water, whichever the case may be, and um, using the aircraft to its maximum ability. So uh, we are generally traveling at about 200 knots, 370 kilometers an hour, um, and rolling at about 400 degrees a second. <laughs> And pulling about 12G. Crikey. So how many races do you do a year? Typically, it's a, it's about eight races a year, uh, eight events a year. So, um, And then you get points at each race, and then you, you know, the person with the most amount of points at the end of the year is crowned the world champion of the race. So yeah. it's a, it is a, it's a world championship for getting points. And do you have a favourite venue to fly at? Uh, that's, I get that one a lot, and... Um, and I don't really have a favourite. You know, it's a, your results have a big impact on how much you enjoy a venue. Um, fortunately, I, I won quite a few races, so I've had some great results. And I've, so I've got, I've got a lot of places that I think are great venues because I've had great results there. But um, um, I'd probably say either Ascot, you know, where you guys are yeah. from, um, Royal Ascot, is just amazing because we took off on the main straight in front of the crowd. So it was ready, set, go with a flag drop and take off in front of the crowd. And 60 seconds later, your race is done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we're racing uh, yeah, around the Royal Tree, uh, yeah, o over the shrubs to go down the back into the golf course and back wow. past down the main straight to finish past past 100,000 people in the grandstand and you'd land back on the grass wow. and everyone standing up cheering. It's like, wow, this is, this is as close as I'm ever going to get to being a rock star. Um, <laughs> But, um, or maybe not, but uh, it's uh, it, that was a pretty special event. Um, but then again, you look at uh, Budapest, where we're starting and finishing under the chain bridge, you know, going under the bridge to start the race. Uh, you look at Spielberg, where we're racing up the face of the uh, yeah, at the Red Bull ring, uh, racing up the face of the um, of one of the, the hills there, up into the Alps, where it's, it was snowing while I was in the racetrack. Wow. I'm flying in the snow. So there's all these things that happened around the world, and, uh, you know, they're, they're all amazing experiences. Yeah, and I think 2019, was that correct? That was a big win for you, wasn't it, um, that championship? Yeah, that, that was that was when I finally won the world championship. Um, I'd uh, I'd come third in the world championship, and I'd been runner-up three times. So I had four world championship trophies at home. It's just none of them were gold, and it was really <laughs> starting to upset me, actually. So I finally, I finally got a gold one uh, in the cabinet. Brilliant. Uh, so, yeah, how did COVID affect um, air racing in general and what do you have planned for the future? Yeah, COVID's uh, shut it down, uh, but they are starting uh, a new air race. Uh, I'm under contract at the moment for uh, another three years of racing. So I'm just waiting for uh, the world to, uh, to be kick-started. Uh, we're always six months off our first race. So at the moment, we're being told our first race is in March next year. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed it happens that way. We're ready to go. The plane's ready. The team's ready. Um, we've just got to ship it to uh, the location of the first race and, and have that race. But, uh, 
you know, um, that's where my future still is. That's where I'm aiming at. We're building the team around racing still. We've got other things going on in the background, but the focus is still being a race team and having people um, grow into that race team so that, you know, when I'm, when I'm a bit uh, old and crusty and can't do it anymore, we've got people behind me that can uh, fill the spot. Brilliant. And I've got a couple of personal questions to wrap up this interview, if you're happy to answer them, Matt. Well, it depends what they are. <laughs> nothing, nothing hard. <laughs> uh, so do you have any hobbies, apart from aviation, of course? I enjoy exercise. So, uh, you know, riding mountain bikes, uh, road bikes, uh, a little bit of motorbikes, uh, stand-up paddle boards, um, the, uh, lighting fires. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I'm an outdoor sort of guy. That's, they're, they're my hobbies. Favourite aircraft you have flown? Uh, it's probably the Spitfire, yeah, just being such a unique aircraft. So I, I love it's it's a nice handling aircraft, and it's it's just one of those planes that's pretty special. You know, I'm fortunate enough to own a must a PPG one Mustang, which is a nice plane to fly. Um, but the Spitfire is probably yeah, you know, and the the Mustang is actually the plane I wanted to fly more than the Spitfire. Okay, but the uh, the Spitfire is um, is probably just that little bit more romantic. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And is there an aircraft you would love to fly that you haven't got to yet? Space shuttle. Space shuttle. Wow, that's a fir- I think that's the first on the channel actually. Space shuttle, right? <laughs> and, I think I'm out of luck there, though. Yeah, I think you're buggered there, mate. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just to wrap up, where can we find you online, Matt? Uh, <laughs> uh, MattHawRacing.com. So um, I think I got that right. Um, I employ a team to. Uh, do that bit but uh, yeah i'm on i'm on facebook i'm on uh instagram I'm on twitter don't ask me how to find me just google me <laughs> and uh yeah it's all on our website mattelracing.com as well brilliant well thank you very much for coming on the show matt it's uh, been a privilege talking to you my pleasure